Uh, thank you, and uh, thank, you, thank the Association for the privilege of giving this, and thank you for having the stamina to still be here on a Wednesday morning. Um, I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief, uh, apropos of uh, Peter's comments. So um, I'm going to talk about the TAVI and the hemodynamics and the relevance of uh, aortic regurgitation. Well, the first question, of course, is does TAVI relieve aortic stenosis? And I think there's a plethora of data on this, uh, and it's quite clear that the two commercially available valves are very, very good at relieving left ventricular outflow tract obstruction because of aortic stenosis. These are data from uh, the Australian, New Zealand, Spanish, and Italian registries showing uh, really very effective relief of aortic stenosis. But is that sustained? These are data from the Italian registry showing that that relief of uh, obstruction persists out to one year. And these are data presented at uh, ESC. This was data from the 20 wharf, 21 French core valve uh, study, so prior to the current uh, system, showing that the relief of aortic stenosis uh, is persistent at least out to four years. So I think to talk about forward flow hemodynamics in these valves, uh, they are very good. I think there is even some suggestion that they may be better than many of the surgically implanted prostheses because of their, their low profile. The situation is not quite the same in relation to uh, aortic regurgitation. Clearly, with a surgical AVR, uh, we very, very rarely see uh, aortic regurgitation. Before I go on to talk about the types of aortic regurgitation and predictors of aortic regurgitation with TAVI, I just want to talk a little bit about how you assess aortic regurgitation. It comes back a little bit to the point that, sorry, I forgot your name, sir, Larry made about assessing uh, valvular regurgitation, and I think the points you made about assessing mitral regurgitation are equally apposite in terms of assessing the, the severity of aortic regurgitation. There are clearly a number of parameters that you can look at echocardiographically, uh, the vena contractor being perhaps the, the, the best thing, and you also can get an idea from the ventricle. You know, if you, uh, the, the, the severity of AR can be uh, assessed to some extent by uh, looking at ventricular function. Continuous wave Doppler is obviously used, and these are sort of typical findings of somebody with very severe aortic regurgitation. Clearly, if you have severe aortic regurgitation, you can look at flow reversal of the descending aorta. But this slide is not to be read. This slide is, gives you an idea of the complexity of evaluating aortic regurgitation. And I think whenever you have a slide like this about how to evaluate something, it means there's not really a very good way of doing it. Um, I was a little bit late today because I had some slight IT problems, so I do apologize for a couple of these videos not working. But I think you can see here, this is uh, paravalvar regurgitation occurring posteriorly around uh, a core valve prosthesis. I think it's quite an interesting observation. I don't know what other people have found, but uh, the, the paravalvar regurgitation is certainly much more common to be posteriorly uh, related. Um, and I think maybe we can, in the discussion, we can talk about why that might be. Uh, again, some very nice data from the Italian registry about the incidence of paravalvar aortic regurgitation and what happens to it over the first year. Uh, and you can see here that, that there's about 20% of patients who have grade 2 or grade 3 aortic regurgitation. And I think if one looks at the other registries, it's pretty consistent that about 15 to 20 patients have more than mild paravalvar aortic regurgitation. So what, what causes this? How can you predict this? Uh, again, the Italian registry, data in relation to positioning of the implant. One of the problems with the core valve is, is the tendency to get the implant a little bit deep into the ventricle. And you can see here that that type of malpositioning is associated with a higher degree of paravalvar aortic regurgitation. 
what else predicts regurgitation? Well, there's a number of papers looking at the ellipticity or eccentricity of the aortic annulus. Um, as you all know, the aortic annulus does not exist. It's a virtual structure. It's not an anatomic structure. And if you look at um, CT scanning of the aortic roots, which we use in, in every patient being assessed for TAVI, there, uh, there is really a very wide uh, variability in eccentricity and shape of uh, the left ventricular outflow tract at the level of the so-called annulus. And here another uh, paper from uh, the Leipzig group, again showing, uh, looking at a, they used a TAVI echo symmetry score uh, of the aortic annulus and found that the more asymmetric the annulus was, the more, the more chance you had of having paravalvar aortic regurgitation. There's been a number of presentations and a, a small number of publications. Uh, this was quite a hot topic uh, at, at, at ESC uh, a month or so ago. Uh, this article showing that the predictive factors for, for aortic regurgitation were, were males, for some reason. A large aortic root, and I think that, is, that has been shown by a number of other um, uh, units and authors, and asymmetric calcification of the aortic annulus. Um, another group here looked at um, the, not just the amount of uh, aortic uh, valvular calcification, but where it was. And they found that the location of the calcification was also uh, a risk factor for, for developing uh, aortic regurgitation. Um, they found that the, the highest risk, risk seemed to be where the calcification was at the base of the cusps near the uh, aortic wall, rather than uh, at the free edge of the cusps, or free edge of the leaflets, sorry, free edge of the leaflets, um, and that having heavy, heavy or dense calcification near, near to the commissures uh, was more predictive of AR than having calcification away from the commissures. So what, what, are the, what are the effects of this regurgitation? And I think these are some factors that we sort of always thought about having paravalvar regurgitation following surgical AVR. Hemolysis. It's not uncommon, as we know, to get hemolysis with a paravalvar leak with a surgical valve. Um, we looked at 20 patients with more than mild paravalvar aortic regurgitation following a core valve implant, and there was no evidence of hemolysis in any of those patients. So I think that's an indicator that the type of regurgitation that you get is different. It is not the same as the paravalvar regurgitation that you get following a surgical valve. And I think, to my mind, looking at lots of these echoes, the, 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 the pictures that you get, I think, is, is of multiple kind of sapiginous flow through little tracts rather than the sort of punched out leak that you get around a surgical valve. Similarly, the risk, a risk of endocarditis was always quoted uh, with paravalvar leak. Um, the incidence of endocarditis following TAVI seems vanishingly small. There's very few specific papers or publications in relation to that, but both early and late endocarditis seems to be very rare uh, with these valves, despite the, the, the incidence of paravalvar regurgitation that I've quoted. What about LV mass regression? Well, in, in, with relieving the forward flow obstruction, uh, you do get LV mass regression. What nobody has done is to see, is to subdivide this group into those patients with and those patients without significant paravalvar regurgitation to see whether there's a difference in mass regression in those patients who do have residual paravalvar regurgitation. However, most importantly is what is becoming clear, and that is the effect of having more than two plus paravalvar regurgitation following a TAVI on survival. And there are a number of um, presentations, abstract presentations, uh, demonstrating that this has an adverse effect on survival. This is data from the Italian registry showing a survival disadvantage in those patients who had more than two plus paravalvar regurgitation, and the same basic data coming from the UK TAVI registry. I think this is an interesting, art, uh, an interesting paper um, presented at uh, ESC again, again confirming the relationship of paravalvar leak to mortality. And you can see there that they graded paravalvar leak into 
trivial, mild to moderate, and more than moderate. And you can see the 12-month mortality figures uh, with a somewhat worrying figure of nearly a 50% mortality in those patients who had a paravalvar leak of more, more than 2+. plus. The other interesting thing in this paper was that they measured BNP in all of these patients. And they found that there was a dramatic finding in those patients who had paravalvar regurgitation, that they had very high BNP levels uh, in hospital. It was a little bit difficult to ask at the time to know when they measured the BNP post-implant. But clearly, in-hospital measurement of BNP in those patients who had paravalvar leaks was quite high. And they noticed that in their lab, uh, a level of NT pro-BNP, as I've shown there, was strongly associated with mortality. So this is a, an interesting slide, and this again comes from the four-year follow-up of the 21 French Corval study. And you've probably heard of this uh, discussion about para paravalvar aortic regurgitation goes away. And you might say, well, this slide shows it. Here you are. You have patients at the beginning who have two-plus paravalvar aortic regurgitation, and there's it goes away and there isn't any by four years. The other explanation, of course, with this is those patients are not alive at four years. Um, there is another type of aortic regurgitation. That's acute severe aortic regurgitation at the time of implant. This can occur with both devices. Uh, this is a case report, but I think we've all seen this, and this is um, leaflet uh, entrapment with the sapien valve occurring post uh, implant. That's a pretty catastrophic situation. There's free intravalvar uh, aortic regurgitation. Um, in this abstract, the patient uh, uh, was successfully treated by a valve in valve in terms of relieving the leak, but the hemodynamic consequences of the period in between uh, eventually led to the patient not surviving. Um, I do apologize, these were some very nice videos of a patient that we recently did who had severe um, intravalvar regurgitation uh, following a uh, core valve implants. And you can see there the, the, the color mapping within the, within the core valve stent. Uh, it was very obvious on fluoroscopy that there was um, uh, failure for the stent to fully deploy. Uh, and again, that was successfully managed by um, balloon valvuloplasty. One can see that the, the valve, the, the, the um, uh, intravalvar AR is gone, but obviously there is still is some posterior paravalvar AR. So to summarize, um, severe intravalvar regurgitation can occur with both devices. The mechanisms are quite different. I think it tends to be leaflet entrapment with the uh, balloon expandable device. I think in the uh, self-expanding core valve device, it is where the frame is not fully expanded and one has valve dysfunction. Paravalvar regurgitation is difficult to quantify. Angiography is very poor at assessing paravalvar regurgitation. You can make it look much better or much worse depending on where you put your pigtail, how much dye you put in, what rate you put the dye in. There possibly would be some utility for, for uh, CMR, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, measuring regurgitant fractions, but this is probably impractical as a, as a routine tool for assessing uh, paravalvar regurgitation in these patients. I think there's increasing data about the predictors of paravalvar AR. It seems, to be, uh, it seems to be more prominent in a large annulus. I think when you have marked annular elliptricity, uh, you are at increased risk. And I think there's an increasing amount of data showing that the volume and distribution of calcification, and possibly even the density of calcification, if one looks at Agaston scoring of, uh, of CTs, you may have quite a bulky uh, calcification in the valve, but it may, may have very low density, and that may be less problematic than a smaller bit of calcification, which has a very high density. And I think I've shown you that suboptimal implant in posi position is also a predictor. So what, do we, what could we do about this? Because we, again, I've shown you that leaving patients with significant paravalvar ER significantly adversely affects survival. While pre-op planning and sizing are very important, I think this comes back to some of the discussions we were having about the last, uh, following Wan's 
talk about patient selection. I think the other thing that needs to be factored into the, that is how anatomically suitable the patient is for a TAVI. If, if there is extensive calcification, a very elliptical annulus, et cetera, et cetera, I think, I think the balance shifts back towards um, a surgical uh, procedure. So pre-op planning, um, and I, I, I believe quite strongly that it should be mandatory to undertake CT scanning prior to TAVI in all patients. Clearly, optimal positioning is a goal that we need to work on to improve uh, our ability to position these valves uh, in the right place. Uh, some new valves coming through that allow one to, to remove and reposition the valves may provide some utility in improving uh, positioning. I think if you do find yourself with um, paravalvar AR, it's very important to try to evaluate this uh, at the time of the procedure, not just how much it is, but what effects it's having. And I think it's very useful to measure the LVDP and compare that to, to the uh, systemic diastolic blood pressure to try to get an idea of what uh, physiological effect that is happening. And as a rule of thumb, if you, t if you take a patient who has no AR as part of their aortic valve disease, they will tolerate paravalvar AR much less so than the patient who has more mixed valvular disease and AR before you start. I think the message that's coming through very clearly is that you need to correct this paravalvar AR at the time of the procedure. I think in the early days we were nervous or relaxed or a mixture of both about leaving these patients, but I think you're probably doing your patient a disservice to allow them to leave the cath lab or the hybrid OR with significant paravalvar AR at the time of the procedure. And there is a whole host of maneuvers you can use, and it depends upon the cause of the, the, the AR. So you need to evaluate, is, is it malpositioning of the valve? Is it suboptimal deployment of the stent, etc.? And then tailor your treatment to uh, to deal with this. Uh, I have to say, I mean, we, most of our experience is with uh, core valve, although we have an Edwards experience, and the, the best way that we've found to deal with paravalve AR is implanting a valve in valve, and that is usually very, very effective at getting rid of paravalve AR. And I think the, the um, use of early post-procedural BNP may be useful, again, in assessing the physiological effect that the paravalvar AR is having on a patient. And that may be a marker that says, well, actually, you, know, you need to take the patient back and have another go or do something, or in an intermediate risk patient, take them to the operating theater and take the valve out and put a surgical valve in. So I hope that gives you a very quick run through uh, about forward flow hemodynamics and the relevance of uh, aortic regurgitation in the TAVI population. Thank you very much.